The Lord be with you. As you are turning in your Bible to John chapter 11, we'll be reading 45 verses there. So I hope you had your coffee this morning. Um, I heard somebody say I didn't. Was it Andy? Okay. I thought so. As you're turning there, I will give you just a momentary glimpse of, or a moment of confession. I was singing a song a moment ago, looked down at the bullets and said, I wonder who's doing children's story today? <laughs> it was me. <laughs> and I remember I said, well, Peggy told me I didn't have to do it again until April 2nd. It's April 2nd. <laughs> it just snuck up on me. So anyhow, so I did prepare for this, though. I knew I was preaching today. Just then. John 11. Verses 1 through 45. I thought about asking you to stand as we read this. But just, John 11, beginning with verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. (coughs) Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, "I, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and calling for you. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up and go quickly out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. 
Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Lord, now we pray that you give us ears to hear what you would have us to hear. Eyes that see, God, what you would have us to see. Hearts that feel, Lord, what you would have us to feel. Hands and feet and lives to do what you call us to do. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. This story, John 11, is the hinge upon which the entire narrative of the fourth gospel swings. It is a story rich in Easter illusions, not so subtle winks at Jesus' own death, burial, and resurrection. It's this very event which causes the high priest Caiaphas and the rest of the religious establishment to decide, now we've got to get him. Now we've got to kill him. The text says so itself, just not too far beyond the reading we had this morning in verse 53. So from that day on, they plan to put Jesus to death. It's a story that shows us the power of Christ, the power to resuscitate a man who had been dead and in the grave, sealed up in a rock cone tomb for four days. And I suppose some would argue it's the most powerful of all of Jesus' post-resurrection or pre-resurrection signs. It tops healing the sick, restoring sight to the blind, causing the lame to leap, and even, even goes farther than feeding 5,000 and more people with a handful of fish and bread. It's a story that captures our imaginations as we visualize Jesus standing there before this cavernous tomb, the smell of death hissing from behind the stone as it's rolled away, breaking the seal between the deceased and the living. We see him standing there like those great concrete statues we see all over cemeteries, strong, determined, yet with this expression of calmness that holds back the cosmic power of the creator of the universe. He calls out Lazarus by name. I heard a preacher say one time, he had to say Lazarus because if he wasn't specific, they'd all come out. I don't know if that's true. But he calls him by name. And when he does, we can almost swear the onion skin pages of our Bible start to vibrate with his power. And then, almost comically, at least in my mind, wrapped in strips of cloth and nothing else, with a handkerchief on his face, out hops Lazarus, the one who had been dead, but is now alive. Why we may even pause for a moment to marvel at the evangelistic outcome of this scene. In verse 45, we read many of the Jews who had come with Mary, seeing what Jesus did, and they believed in him. We may pause even there to ponder for a moment the persuasive power of Jesus' reviving of Lazarus. 
This is no doubt one of the most memorable and captivating stories in all of Scripture. But I have to tell you something. I have to tell you. It captures my attention in a different way this morning. You see, I think it, while it's easy to be swept up in the resolution of the story, to focus one's attention on the powerful outcome of Christ's presence at the tomb of his beloved friend Lazarus, I can't help but be more than just a bit distracted by the beginning of the story. It's like an itch. You just got to scratch. You know it's not important. It's probably nothing. It'll go away, but it just won't. And so you got to scratch it. You see, I can't help but wonder. Every time I read this, I can't help but wonder. Why in the world? Does Jesus stay two days longer in the place where he was after getting word from Mary and Martha that the one whom he loved was ill? Seriously, I, now, now, now I know, I know some folks, some of you will say, well, Chris, now you know, Jesus knew Lazarus would die and he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. So Jesus, Jesus just hung out a little bit where he was as a part of God's plan. And then went on to Bethany. Maybe. I suppose there's room, room in the text for that argument. But if I'm honest, it sounds a little too much like those easy one-liners that some preachers give at funerals. Those sort of theologically veneered words that only attempt to speak to the spiritual complexity of the moment. People who say things like, God needed another angel in his choir in heaven, so he called your tenor home. God's ways are higher than ours. No need to try to figure it out. Just, just let it be there. Or I swear to you, a friend of mine in seminary said that he had heard a preacher say this at the funeral of a small child. God just needed another flower in his garden, so he picked yours. I suppose, I suppose there's room in life for those sort of uh, trite sayings, those attempts to comfort one another. I suppose there's room in the text to say that Jesus tarried two days because it was a part of his plan. Verse 4 seems to maybe imply such a position. But if I'm honest with you, it just doesn't sit well with me. It doesn't sit well with me and what I believe about Jesus. It doesn't seem right to me that Jesus would let his beloved friend die. That he would let Mary and Martha go through the pain, the suffering, the grief of losing their brother. That he would just stay in the place where he was. The Bible doesn't say he did anything else. The Bible doesn't say he healed someone else. He taught something. That he fed somebody. That he gave sight to the blind. In fact, the language seems to suggest Jesus just literally stood in one place for two days and didn't move. He didn't move. It doesn't seem Right, that he would stay in one place long enough for the family to gather, for the body to be prepared, for the funeral to be held, for the casseroles to be dropped off, the jugs of tea, the rolls, the baskets of chicken to be left on Mary and Martha's counter, for everything to have taken place, for the stone to be rolled back over the entrance to the tomb and the body of Lazarus left to decay. It just doesn't seem right. It seems off. I'd like to think that if it had been me, it would have gone differently. Because, friends, I'm telling you right now, if Denise and Karis, uh, the two sisters of my best friend John, sent word to me that John was ill, lying up in the ICU and didn't have long to make it, I'm sorry, I'd call Bob Ford. Somebody'd have to stand here. I'm going. I'm getting in the truck to go. Sure, there's the Lord's work to do, but isn't that part of it too? To be with people in their hour of need and grief. I bet most of you, probably all of you in this room, would do and say the same thing if you got such a call. But I tell you, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't seem right. Especially all the trouble that the fourth gospel goes through to tell us how much Jesus loved Lazarus. I think I've told you before, I'm convinced John is not the beloved disciple. It's Lazarus. The gospel goes on all the time. Look how he loved him, the one who he loved, the one he loved. There he is. 
He go out of his way. It just seems like Jesus would have dropped what he was doing and headed down to Bethany as soon as he got word. Lord, the one whom you love is ill, to which Jesus would have said, all right, boys, pack it up. We're going to Bethany. Doesn't matter what happened. Doesn't matter what's going on. Lazarus is ill and I'm going down there. And if I can't raise him, if I can't heal him, I'm at least going to be with Mary and Martha. Wouldn't it be a powerful sign, too? One he had done before. One he knew he was capable of doing, healing his friend Lazarus. Wouldn't healing Lazarus avoided the broken hearts of two sisters, of a family, a friend? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it catches me every time I read the story. But I think, I think there's another verse in the text that sheds some light on this quandary. In many English translations, it's the shortest verse in the whole Bible. John eleven thirty five. The old King James says, Jesus wept. Used to be my favorite memory verse when I would go to Sunday school every once in a while. The NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, captures the proper conjugation just a little bit better. Jesus began to weep. It's interesting to me what causes Jesus to begin weeping. In verse 32, it says, When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Who else said it? Mary. Word for word. It's important to notice. It's the exact same words that, that, that Martha uses in verse 21, after which Jesus gives her this sort of compact lesson about eternal life and resurrection, giving her one of the ego, a me sayings, the I am sayings of the fourth gospel. But the story goes on in verses 33 and 34, that when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her were also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit. Some translations say he was angry. I don't know. Deeply disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? Words another Mary would say in just a few more days about him. Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. It's that phrase right there, that phrase uttered right before we're told Jesus began to weep, come and see, that is filled with more meaning than we may first realize. You see, in three other places in the fourth gospel, that exact phrase is used. Jesus speaks these words when he calls his first two disciples. He says, come and follow me. What can we do? Come and and see. Just a few verses later in chapter 1, verse 46, Philip is speaking to his friend Nathaniel about this man he has met, this man who seems amazing and wonderful, a man who he's going to follow, a man from Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip says, come and see. And the third time is in chapter 4, after Jesus meets with a Samaritan woman by a well, and she's there telling all of her friends, all of her neighbors in the community, I met this man, he knew everything about me, he was this, How, who is such a man, how can he be here? And her words to the people there, come and see. In every case, including, including the one before us, when these weeping mourners say these words to Jesus, in every case, these are words of invitation. Words that invite one to draw closer into the life of God's kingdom to witness the inbreaking reality of God. It's at the speaking of these words, come and see, that Jesus begins to weep. And I think, I think it may be because they are the words that have triggered something deep within our Lord. The emotional straw that broke the camel's back. These were the words used to call people into the kingdom. Maybe even words Jesus had used to call Lazarus himself. I don't know. Maybe. And now these words are being spoken to Jesus. And maybe, just maybe those words, those three words, come and see, released in Jesus what he had been holding on to since he got word from Martha and Mary at least four days earlier. That one word, those three words, that one phrase, come and see. 
It released something. I think that may be it. I can imagine. But then again, I don't really have to imagine what that's like. I don't have to imagine because I've been there. I remember when I got the message. It's about eight years ago, sitting in my office, getting somewhat settled for the day when my cell phone rang. It was my dad. Now, my dad doesn't call me or anybody, really. I don't even think he'll call the pizza delivery guy. If he could send smoke signals, he'd probably do that first. But when I answered the phone, I heard Ned on the other end say, Son, your grandma ain't doing too good. Won't be long now. Just wanted to let you know. Ask if you do the funeral. I hadn't really done a funeral uh, at that point in my time as a pastor. I'd been to several. Maybe read a passage of scripture, prayed it one or two, but hadn't really put one together. Hadn't actually done a whole funeral. But I told my dad, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do it because I couldn't imagine who else would. And I didn't want some preacher who didn't know my grandma trying to preach her into hell and everybody else into heaven. So dad told me, he said, well, we're not sure how long grandma will hold out, but it could be a week or two. It wasn't. It was a day or two. The next phone call came. I packed a suit, a white shirt, black shoes, a blue tie, black leather belt, and Sally and I drove down to Enterprise. Looking back, to tell you the truth, I really wasn't upset. I was fine. I mean, I went to my home church that Sunday, talked to people like nothing had happened. Oh, we're sorry to hear about your grandma. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. How are things going with you? What's going on down here? Do y'all like the new preacher? That kind of stuff. Showed up at the visitation that afternoon. There was my dad, my two aunts, my uncle, standing by this sort of gaudy casket that I was sure either one of my aunts or my uncle had picked out because there was no way Grandma would literally be caught dead in that thing. <laughs> and I know, I know Dad wouldn't have picked it out. Dad would have said, well, I can't say what Dad would have said. Um, but there they were. There was that box. I was fine. I was fine. Shook hands with people who knew me, even though I didn't know them. Saw people I hadn't seen in years, maybe decades. Was hugged by total strangers and people I had known my whole life. Still, though, I was fine. I was fine. Saw Grandma in that box, wearing a dress. I didn't even know Grandma had a dress. I'm pretty sure they bought it or borrowed it for Grandma. She she, She always wore jeans, the kind with elastic at the ankles and the waist. Old t-shirts, flannel shirts. If she wore shoes, they were black rubber boots or old worn out white tennis shoes. They had her hair fixed. She had on makeup. I didn't think Grandma even knew what makeup was. And I remember too, her glasses were clean. Grandma, Grandma's glasses were never clean. They either had dirt or bits of chicken on them. (laughs) And that's not a joke. Grandma worked in a process and plant pulling gizzards, so it's probably gizzard. I saw her in that box, and I was still fine. Nothing wrong. Next day came, put on my suit, my white shirt, my blue tie, my black shoes, carried my black Bible, and my little five-by-seven note cards, paper clipped in, in the various pages uh, where I had scrapped down, scratched down the service for that day. I was fine. I arrived at the funeral home an hour before the rest of the family. More awkward handshakes and hugs. More introductions of people who knew me without me knowing them. More time to look at Grandma in that box. But I was still fine. I was fine. Eventually, the funeral director came in, asked all the friends, if y'all would, just go have a seat in the chapel. We'll get started in a little bit. Let the family have a little bit more time with, the, with, the, with each other. And I remember there was this sort of stiff accordion divider, you know, the one that's never quiet. He pulled that shut, closed the doors leading to the parlor, told us we'd have a few more minutes with Grandma before the service. A few of my folks stepped out the side door to burn one more cigarette before the service. I suspect they thought I might have been long-winded and might be going through withdrawals as we went. But the rest of us, the rest of us just sort of mumbled and started counting the, the thread in the carpet. But I was fine. After a few minutes, the funeral director walked back in, gave a few instructions about the service, how we're going to walk down, where you're going to sit, all that jazz. And then he said, 
Before we go out, I'm going to ask the minister to offer a word of prayer. I was the only one looking around. Where's the minister? Where is he? I forgot. I was the minister. It was me. But I was fine. Prayer is easy. I do it every day, multiple times a day. Did the same thing. I've done countless times before and countless times after. I took a half step forward, looked around the room, stood up so my gut wouldn't hang out so much. Let us pray. In that moment, I saw people I know who had never darkened the door of a church. People who, who hadn't been there in decades. Folks who drank, cussed, smoked, ran around, lied, cheated, stole. Folks who were decent enough but likely would never make the front page. Never be in anybody's list of outstanding citizens. Saw them bow their heads, close their eyes like it was something they did every day before lunch. I said, let us pray. And the next word was God. That was it. I wrote here, don't cry, sissy. (laughs) That was it. Turns out I wasn't fine after all. My throat closed up. My jaw felt like it was going to rattle loose from my head. My eyes were burning and heavy. I tried to say more, but I couldn't. All I could say was God. I had put off the inevitable for as long as I could. I had resisted the urge to mourn, believing there was something more important. I had to be the preacher, after all. Something, some task that needed tending to first. But I couldn't hold it back anymore. That word broke the emotional levy. And in that room, in that moment, there was no easy one-liner that could console me. No bumper sticker religion that was going to make me feel better. No one could have quoted any verse of scripture and changed my mind about how I felt in that moment. No, in that moment, I needed a deeper faith. I needed the kind of faith that says it's okay to weep. The kind of faith that makes it all right to mourn. The kind of faith that recognizes the reality of pain and grief that comes with life and death. I need that kind of faith. I believe we all do. I believe we all need that kind of faith. Because when the time comes, when when the roof leaks, when the rent is due, when you stand by the box or over the hole scratched in the earth, Those quaint sayings we often say to one another or offer to others won't be enough to sustain us. We need a faith that tells us it's okay to be overwhelmed. That the weight of the world is impossible to carry alone. Not that God will never put on you more than you can handle, but you better believe there's going to be more than you can handle, and it's up to you to ask God to help carry it. That when our hearts break and our minds are troubled, That we have a God who's been there. Who will go with us, not again, not three times, not seven times, not even seven times, 70 times, but every single time. Because he's never going to leave. Never going to give up on us. And never, by the way, never doesn't mean until you're put in the ground. Never means beyond death itself. That's the kind of faith we need. And thanks be to God, it's the kind of faith we have. That's the kind of Savior we have in Christ Jesus, whose heart breaks when our hearts are broken, whose mind is troubled when our minds cannot be still, whose eyes weep when we can't hold back the tears anymore. That's the kind of Savior we have. The kind of God we have in Jesus. One who doesn't dismiss our distress as a lack of faith. Well, if you'd had more faith, you wouldn't be going through this. No. We have the kind of God who was always there. Standing at the tomb with us. Calling us back. Reminding us in life's little winks and whispers that death does not have the last word. That a grave is just a temporary plot. And that there will always, always be life where there once was death. 
Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who scripture says wept by the tomb of his beloved friend. Help us, God, to embrace a faith, a deep faith, that calls us more, calls us to more than easy one-liners, to more than two easy proof texts. Call us, Lord, deeper into a faith that reminds us that you go with us not only when life is sunshine and roses, but as the psalmist says, even through death's dark valley. Remind us, God, as we draw ever closer to Good Friday in Calvary, why we call that day good. Not because of its pain, not because of its anguish and agony, but because, Lord, it's a day that reminds us you have gone everywhere we could go. And you go with us, even through the pain of death. Holy Spirit, speak to us in this place. Help us, God, to see you are a God who walks with us through all of life's heartaches, all of life's pains, as well as all of life's joy. And God, in that, give us hope. Remind us of the good news that death never has the last word. Be with us now, Lord Jesus, we pray. Stir in our hearts. Have us, Lord, to move as you would have us to move. In Christ's name we pray, amen.